morning. We're here today with Ian Moore, who's agreed to come and talk to us about the art of ship modeling, scale ship modeling. This is static. These are display-only models. Uh, about a year ago, Ian was kind enough to give us an introduction overview of concerns regarding ship modeling and specifics to that form of modeling. He's come back today to get a little deeper on some specific topics that pertain to ship modeling. Thanks for being here, Ian. My pleasure, Bill. Thank you. Um, and you know, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about ship modeling because ship modelers are much less common than uh, other gen genres. Anyway, um, just to, to start off, I want to cover off today um, some basics and to familiarize some terminology and uh, assistance in how to do rigging of ship models and flags, uh, proper wearing of flags in, on ships. Um, so with that to say, to start, um, here's, uh, here are plans for the standing rigging and running rigging. Um, that is what you see now is the, is the standing rigging sorry, the running rigging and the standing rigging is on the other side here. There are two different functions on the ship. The, the, running, the standing rigging supports the masts and keeps them in position um, and allows access to the top of the masts. So it mostly, on a, on a ship of the line like the Leopard here, uh, they would weigh tons because they would be tarred ropes and there'd be a lot of them. The running rigging is used to control the yards and, uh, and the sails uh, back in the old days. Uh, fortunately, we're not going to talk much more about that aspect of rigging ships because uh, that takes months and is a real discipline. Um, but uh, you know, the there's there's a lot of uh, involved with blocks and tackles, and in the running rigging, they run uh, in a as I said in the previous time in a pyramid shape to support the mast against fore and aft forces and sideways forces. They're pretty well static and and welded or. A, tarred in place with blocks and tackle. The running rigging, on the other hand, in order to move a yard arm or sail, you had to loosen one side, tighten the other. You could raise the yard up and down with topping lifts and so on. Um, so it, sailing ships were quite a complex uh, function. Now, would it be safe to say that for a static uh, sailing model, yes. that the standing rigging that would, that would have to happen, and there's no choice about it, you've got to make that that is the support structure for the whole thing. You can, yes, you can simplify it, but basically you want to make sure your masts are in a, a good upright position, usually with a little bit of a rake to them. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, without, without standing and rigging, holding the mast up, you, you're not going to go anywhere. The wind would blow your mast down. But when you do a running rigging, yes. that would be akin to making a, say, a model airplane that's flying. Yeah. wheels up and all the rest of it. it. You wouldn't typically do that for a static ship model? No, not necessarily. You tend to show it in one position. Getting Having them operating would be very complex because you'd have to move a lot of very small block and tackles and then tie them down. Yeah. Um, but uh, it would be similar to the air on an aircraft that you know you move one and the opposite one goes the other way. So you can move the yards depending on whether you're sailing into the wind or from the wind, uh, you, you'd be moving the yards around it. Uh, a lot of sailors in the old days didn't get much rest, that's for sure. Um, one of the things that uh, also other structures are supported by rigging, um, the uh, funnel stays on ships are uh, static lines that are going to hold the, the mast up. And one of the little techniques that I discovered uh, recently was to, uh, if you can look at this as an example, is to use um, 
kind of floppy. The, presuming this is the funnel, you run the line or, or a line up over the top of the funnel, you then tie down a piece over the top of it, and that gives you a chance to glue the funnel stays in position on each of the four sides, and then you trim off all this ex <coughs> excess threads in the middle and on the back there. Um, you also notice that I have little eye bolts on the deck, and the eye bolts are done with fine wire, and you just make a little twist in it, and you've got a, a potential Oh, sorry, get that down against the, uh... anyway, take my, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you do a little twist in it and then snip it off and you've got a, a potential eye bolt that you can glue into your deck as a tie down. Um, typically on running rigging, you would have um, eye bolts on all four corners of the ship so that the rigging would come down, as I said before, on a, a pyramid shape from the top of the mast to to the uh, to the side. Uh, on a larger capital ship like a cruiser here, you will have maybe several levels of uh, stays on the sides. So they will go to the lower mast top to support that, and then the upper top mast would also be supported by its own set of stays going from there to the to the deck edges on in both cases. Um, the in the case of the HMS hood, for example, in the 1920s, you would see um, top masts being supported by stays that only instead of going all the way down to the deck, they just went from the starfish, which is the the structure about halfway up the mast, it's at the top of the main mast and supports the upper mast. Then you have the yard arms, which are supported by topping lifts to keep them straight. And you also have a gaff down here, and on the front of the mast you have a, a large boom for lowering and, and raising boats. I think it's pretty typical. Yeah. That, that's a side view plan. Yes. But they turn the the arms just slightly to give you the perspective, like you were exactly from the exactly. Front. So yeah. you're getting a side and front view kind of combined. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, another shot, and and that is in fact the the uh, main mast on the hood, uh, which I took from this book here, that uh, the Anatomy of the Ship series, and. Uh, they are excellent references for um, detailed drawings of all parts of ship structure. Uh, there's the funnel stays I was just talking about, uh, for example, on the hood. Um, there's the hood's forward superstructure and mast arrangement with the yard arms. And from the yard arms, you have signal halyards running down to the flag decks or the signal decks, which are these areas down here. Um, you also have uh, lots of uh, Jacob ladders running up the back of the mast. And uh, a lot of this structure is common and will be found on all different ships to, to some degree. Uh, so in the case of, of uh, a frigate, for example, it's much less complex. You've got a four stay, you've got side stays on either side, you have uh, an ap after wireless array going down to the main mast. Incidentally, um, on a ship, the front mast is usually called the foremast, not necessarily the main mast. The main mast may be this piece here, even though it's much smaller. Um, and that causes a, a fair amount of confusion sometimes. The foremast is almost all where all of the signaling goes from because it's closest to the bridge in almost all cases. Um, when building a ship, try and do the running rigging first, simply because it's the more complex. On a, if you're doing a sailing ship, 
the reverse is true. Do the standing rigging first and then do the running rigging later. Uh, that's pretty well the way they would be fitted out. But on a, on a, a small scale ship model, it's usually better to do the running rigging first. Uh, for this reason is that uh, if you replace your masts with with wire or or brass uh, thick brass pieces, you want to run the rigging so that it does not put excess stress on the mast. And there's two things. One is to pull your thread over a candle so that the the line is waxed. Uh, that way, it won't absorb moisture from the air, and then I'll become limp and useless later. Um, um, so start on the inboard side or the in innermost side closest to the mast and start to run your, your line up and down. Uh, here is an example of how, you, how I generally attach my, my rigging. I use clove hitches to tighten down. And a clove hitch is simply a loop that way. Oops, sorry. A loop that way, and then a loop the other way. So you have the line coming off in two different directions out of the knot, and then you tighten it down. Uh, and that's a very convenient form of lashing. So in the case of doing these, I would use one, one, one piece of thread and I'd uh, tie it on with a with, uh, clove hitch on the inboard side, run it down to the back of the bridge to the flag deck, run it back up and tie it on the same knot so you'd come back up like that. Basically you're running a halyard would look like this, be run, run down to the mast and that way you would have a loop that you could raise and lower flags on. And that's the, the function of, of halyards or hall yards. Um, the, and once you, so you'd go down on one side and up the other, then you'd loop, loop over, go down and back up on the other side until you've gone at least three or four halyards on either side. Now, on very small ships, I will tend to, I don't know, let me see, um, tend to drill a hole in the back of the flag deck with a small drill. If you're using tippet line or fishing line, uh, you would run it down and put it through the hole and back up and secure each halyard in turn. And that can put strain on the mass, especially if you don't replace the plastic ones with brass. Um, then as long as your mast is still lined up, you've got it tightened up but not tight enough to pull the mast out of alignment, then you put the standing rigging on and, and secure it down. Standing rigging almost always has insulators on it, um, which you can't see on this one. <laughs> uh, there, there are insulators on this on the uh, wireless lines that run from the top of the mast to the to the main mast, and uh, the gaff, the flag gaff, is is on the on the aft side of the main mast here. Um, Jacob's ladders, as I mentioned, always run up the back of the mast and usually a little bit of photo etch or something is, is very good for doing that. There's lots of photo etch ladders out there. Uh, let's talk about ship's boats for a minute. Um, the ship's boats are done in several ways. Um, they can be quite complex. Uh, this is a cutter on board hood, and you can see there is a safety net. There are uh, hand lines along the uh, main davits. The davits are swung out one at a time, and um, uh, there's a number of things here. Like there's a griping spar, which the boat rests against uh, on puddings, which keep the boat from swinging back and forth and, and damaging itself. And then there's block and tackle to lower the boat on each on each side. When a boat is lowered, uh, and this one is an example of a whaler, um, a little bit simpler, 
than the cutters. Uh, you'll notice that there are straps holding the, the whaler in position on the, uh, against the davits, and again, that prevents damaging from, damage from happening. Uh, the, the block and tackle are there to the top of the davit head, and the lifelines go to the, to the main safety line across the davits. So when the boat's wound out, the, the uh, safety lines, and again, they can be, the, the crew would be actually in the boat as it's being lowered, and they would be holding on to the safety line because if the boat hits the water and gets swamped or something, you want to be holding on to something besides the boat. Um, notice also the straps are just pieces of, of tape that are, are secured down. Uh, oars are all secured within the boat fore and aft. Also this little line here uh, runs from the bow of the boat and it's the boat's painter, which is uh, the bow line basically. Uh, the painter is run from the uh, bow of the boat up to a, a bollard forward on the ship so that when the boat goes down the rudder is is uh, in so that the boat would be automatically veer out away from the ship and uh, just like a surfboard it would tend to pull the boat out away from the ship and once the blocks are, are released with one safety pick catch uh, you'd be free and clear, and then you could row away. Um, so, uh, an interesting uh, process. Um, boat booms, and I don't have a good example of that, but boat booms are uh, secured against the side of the ship. Um, they're usually seen up against uh, uh, at an angle on the forward part of the ship and they would be uh, out from the side of the ship attached at the base and the outboard side would have uh, two or three lines, one in each direction and one centrally to support them uh, centrally so that they don't swing out of position and the crew would then go out and access the boat by uh, climbing down the boat boom. And here's, here's a picture of the, uh, oops, sorry, I have there's a picture of the boat boom and the, it would have a ladder down and, oh, sorry, that's a yard arm. Anyway, it, very similar structure, except that they would have Jacob's ladders running down from the boom to the water line and the boats uh, would be accessed to that. and tied up to that when not in use. There'd always be a boom uh, at the after end of a ship on a capital ship like this, the uh, Berwick. You'd have boat booms at the back. The accommodation ladders would come down from the side of the ship up forward here and the boats would be tied off at the stern and the boats would have to wait their turn to go to the accommodation ladder to pick up an admiral or whoever. Um, so um, again, cranes and booms would always have uh, lines at 45 degree angles towards the tip of the boom to control, just like the yard arm, it control its movement one way or the other. You can lift it up or down, move it side to side, and the, the rear end or the bottom end would almost always be fixed against the side of the ship. Carly floats. Um, Carly floats came in all sorts of, of uh, uh, sizes and colors. Uh, even up into the 1950s, you had uh, an example of a Carly float on a minesweeper, the, the uh, fundy here, and they were still in use until then. And it was only in the, late in the 60s that they started using uh, inflatable life rafts, which the, this also shows inflatable life, raft, life rafts stowed against the, the superstructure. Um, they would be a hydraulic, of course, and if they hit the water and the valve uh, 
line is pulled, they would inflate themselves or, and be self-inflating. They would also float to the surface. They had uh, switches that would uh, dissolve when the raft was immersed in water, uh, underwater. They would be pressure valves, like the pressure valve on a depth charge, and it would release the float to pop to the surface and then inflate itself. And that still exists today. But the old Carly floats, per se, were cork features or functions, and they just uh, had uh, a, a large piece of cork wrapped in canvas, usually unpainted on a lot of ships, but uh, as this one is, but uh, with wooden slats and or netting in the bottom, and they'd go anywhere from 20 to 5 to 20 to 40 man rafts. In this case of the Corvette, they have uh, four um, small five-man Carly floats and a couple of small uh, two or five-man floats on different positions. You notice also that late in the war, uh, the RCN always painted their, uh, their rafts uh, a red and yellow quadrants so that they would be visible because they were more concerned with saving lives at that stage than they were about fighting well, they were concerned about fighting as well, but um, it was a matter of, of saving saving the lives of, of people. Um, and they had to be visible for that to happen. They Again, that's something that the war experience taught them. Um, this process of uh, clove hitches is also extremely good for doing the lashing on rafts, which you always had hand lines so the guys could hang off the side of the rafts in the water if there wasn't enough uh, raft for, for the people involved. Another little tip, um, I mentioned the use of tie-downs for tying down your rigging. If you do the same thing and make a double, a double loop, a figure eight with a piece of wire, and I'm just using very soft beading wire, um, and it's very, very easy to, to, to do. So you make a double loop like a figure eight, you twist it at right angles to one another, and then you can just slide the loop onto a, a piece of mast and or onto your yard arm, and you'd have ready-made loops for tie down. So it's very easy to loop up from one to the other. Um, in this case, this mast is not soldered. It's just super glued on and um, is just, again, floor wire or brass wire, either works. And you tie, you, you uh, use a, a file to file about a third of the way through the main mast, put the yard against it, glue it down, and then tie it on with a loop of thread uh, going from behind the mast forward to the yard arm and then back behind the mast and tie it. And that's all there is to it. Um, that works on pretty well all scales. Um, Kisby rings. Kisby rings are where are we? Are the little single man life preservers that you find on a ship and they're usually sighted behind the bridge wings, up on near the bow end or near the stern on most vessels so that they're readily accessible. If somebody goes man overboard, you th the first thing you do is throw a Kisby ring over to where the, the guy went over and hopefully the, they will find it and, and cling to it until the ship does a turnabout and, and comes back to pick them up. That's the theory. Um, Kisby rings are common on all ships and very seldom seen on models. So uh, it's, a, it's a challenge to get them modeled. Um, one of the things I do with a very small scale, um, which I don't know if you can see that or not, um, is very slight, small slices of, of uh, evergreen tubing and then they can be glued against the side of the, the side of the ship in the appropriate positions. They can be painted or not. Uh, white is usually a standard color or uh, post-war now they're all neon red. So they're again for visibility. 
Um, as I mentioned before, I tend to use a lot of different colored lines. Uh, Unithread is very good for very, very fine running rigging lines because it's brown and very easy to work with. Uh, larger scales, you know, fishing line uh, comes in very good in different colors and can be used to uh, do lines. Uh, you also have Easy Line, which is a la somewhat elastic, but very easy to just stretch from one yard to another and glue it down, and it's readily available. Um, you you want to be careful with lines. The uh, something that someone asked me recently is how big are the lines on a ship? Well, hawsers, which are these things that are rolled up on on cable reels, are only uh, even for the hood. They were only a maximum of about four or four and a half inches in, in diameter. So they weren't huge, monstrous cables. They, they, were, they were rope or hemp, uh, sometimes wire, uh, but they were adequate to do the job. To keep them neat and out of the way, they would roll them up in, into hot, uh, cable reels, and, uh, which had handles on them, by the way, uh, like cranks, like starting a car. So you would crank them onto the onto the reels and then roll them out when you're ready to come alongside. Um, in the case of, of Berwick here, you can see some lines flaked out along the side and also coiled up in different, different positions as coils um, just to keep them out of the way. So a flaked line is one that's run back and forth along a stretch and uh, other coils were just mean, meant they haven't had time to get them out of the way because in peacetime coils of rope all over the place weren't, weren't very uh, tolerated. In wartime of course you see a lot of pictures of corvettes in particular that had coils of rope all over the place um, uh, because the discipline to get them out of the way just wasn't there. Um, Coiling lines is not hard to do. You uh, simply take a piece of line, wet it with some a combination of white glue or or carpenter's glue. Where are we? Carpenter's glue. You make a little puddle, and you put the line in it, and you simply roll the line. Oops. hold it down, roll the line round and round until it's big enough and then you just slide it off, wait for the glue to dry and glue it down and then you've got a little coil of rope. I would pick a plaid shirt today, wouldn't I? Um, doing fire hoses, uh, pieces of elastic band flattened, can be again coiled up against the side of the, of the ship for for uh, usually over a U-shaped uh, holder and they can be uh, folded back and forth and glued down and used as fire hoses and look fairly realistic, especially if painted. Talking about berthing hawsers, uh, hawsers are used to, to tie the ship up or to tow other ships or whatever. Um, this is a, a, an example out of a seamanship manual of the lines, the lines that are used on tying a ship up. So you've got, uh, a, a, the, they're tied fore and aft, to, not directly to the dock, but they're tied quite a ways to a bollard on the pier or the dock um, at, uh, at a fairly acute angle. Then there are springs. There's a head spring, so it goes from the after bollard here at the quarter deck area up to the bow, uh, bow uh, fair lead up on the bow, and then secured. And so you've got springs going each way, and uh, to have the ship coming or going out of the dock, you'd usually release the stern ropes. You'd 
release the this after spring would be gone and then you would power forward so you put tension on the after the after head spring and as you came in against the dock you would then go astern and release your head rope and away you go um, but I guess the the main point is don't put lines directly straight to the dock because they they're always at angles so you you can use the the leverage effect of the different lines to move the ship you can actually walk the ship up along a pier just using the lines alone um, ground tackle ground tackle is not just something that Roger Kelsey does um, this is your ground tackle which are your anchors on, on your vessels uh, that controlled your cables and again they go to cable lockers down below the the, uh, the deck so uh, they would run down through hawse pipes to anchors they would run up th over your windlass and go down into the cable locker something that's almost always omitted on most ships models are the uh, Blake slips and screw slips. There are two kinds. They, are, they go from a uh, clasp on the deck up onto and, and clamp over a, one of the cables of, or the shackles of the cable and that, that acts as a safety device to hold the cable in place so that somebody accidentally lets go of the windlass and you're not dropping all your anchors in the middle of the harbor somewhere. Um, or you can drop one and not the other by using the windlass selectively. The, the slips hold them in place. And you've all seen that on, on fishing programs, knocking the cable free and getting the heck out of the way as the, as the anchor or the line or the buoy line runs out. Uh, but that's something that's almost always omitted on, omitted on models. Um, scramble nets are something that most ships carry. Um, the, these are, in this case, here on the, on the after end of the quarter deck, um, particularly in wartime vessels. In, on uh, American ships, they almost always are contained in, in these photo etch, or shown as photo etch baskets that contain floater nets, and they had cork floats all over them, so they would float in the water. In most cases, they're just simply attached at one end to the to the uh, uh, stanchions on a ship or the handrails, and then in the case of survivors being in the water, they would lower them over the side, and they would scramble up and down uh, to try and pull the guys up out of the oil-soaked water. You see that in photos quite a lot, but those those scramble nets were kept in place and available for lowering uh, very quickly. They'd just be dumped over or pushed over the side. Um, Dan boys. Dan boys and no Patrick Doyle, they are not, it's not Danny boy, it's Dan boy. Um, that's something that you can see here on the Minesweeper and they are usually painted different colors depending on the side. Their purpose and uh, in the case of the starboard one here, you'll see the Dan Bowie and the and the weights that are used. So they'd be tied to the bottom of the end of the Dan Bowie, and as you swept a channel, the Dan Bowie would be dropped in, in in line, marking a starboard side or the port side of a channel uh, to, to no, show that the way is clear. And they are found on a lot of different ships. Um, their, their purpose is channel marking. Uh, they have weights and, and lines to, to show and, and to do. They are, again, very simply done. Here is one in, in the bottom here that is done for, uh, again, with evergreen sprue and a little piece of wire and painted up appropriately, and, and you've got Dan Boys for, for your different ships. Um, Paravanes and otters. Paravanes, again, uh, are a minesweeping function, and you have 
otters, which uh, again can be constructed from, from evergreen plastic. And their purpose was to act as a kite. When the paravane is put over, the otter is put below it and streamed so that it keeps the, 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 the paravane will float at the top of the water. We'll have a line with a cutter attached to it and the otter would keep it at a certain depth. So as, the, as it streamed behind the sweeper or the, from the bows of a, of a large ship like the Hood or the Berwick, it would, uh, the cutter would cut the mines and they'd float to the surface. So it, it would keep the, the ship from running into a, into a mine. Um, mine sweeping davits are very distinctive. They're always uh, uh, usually on the stern of the ship particularly during the wartime. In the early war, they had corvettes with mine sweeping gear, uh, which they found were, wasn't a very f efficient function of a corvette. So they, after the first, after 1941, the corvettes were built without them. They were almost always turned inboard so that you wouldn't see any reflection on them or uh, they would be out of the way. And depth charges were much more important. So that's what they ended up doing. Um, Dressing of ships. Um, let me skip ahead here. This is an example of a ship being dressed overall. Um, and it's very uh, interesting to know that the there is a specific arrangement that you just don't put up on your old flag. It, they go according to a, this laid out instruction and you have a, a combination of flags and pennant, flags and pennant, uh, with your jack and ensigns being flown at other higher points. Uh, so there's a very specific func way of doing that. Uh, I also have there's an example of uh, a battleship being dressed overall. And you'll notice she's flying th three or four different ensigns uh, because they, they basically put an ensign at the top of every mast and uh, ran the, the flags up. These were usually hoisted from the uh, bow up to the, to the uh, foremast and the mainmast and only uh, uh, stretched up at uh, sunrise and, and sunset, they were taken down. But that would be done for uh, when you're tied up in port for any public holidays or Queen's birthday or anything like that. Um, Davids. Davids are these little curved jobbies that are shown, well, here for example. Um, they uh, they are used for hoisting. They usually almost always had block and tackle going from the top of the David to the to the bottom. Uh, they were secured down so they weren't rattling a boat in the middle of a sea because a, a heavy block flying around could certainly hurt somebody. Um, but they were also used for hoisting uh, depth charges from the spare racks up onto the main rack or from the uh, up onto the thrower. Uh, so they could they were movable. Uh, and usually it would have multiple Davids around to, to move uh, uh, heavy objects. Um, they would often be shown, as in this case, um, a David over the uh, a crew access hatch. Uh, the hatch cover would be removable and you lower stores up and down through the David, uh, through the hatch with, with Davids. Um, and they, they often appear in multiple places on the ship. These ventilators, um, as you see all over a lot of ships, also can be made from uh, pieces of evergreen tubing with a uh, metal piece stuck up through the middle of it. There is actually one in here, which you can just barely see. Uh, but you can make David uh, ventilators uh, appropriately that way and you, you'll see on a lot of a lot of ships I have actually I did a King George 
ventilators all over the thing because there weren't any available. And if you look at pictures, they're everywhere. Usually up over every crew compartment. Um, so flags often uh, would be used, and as I mentioned earlier, they're, uh, oh, just as a last shot at paravanes, there's an example of how a paravane would be slung from the bow of a large capital ship. In this case, it came out of the hood book. And the, the little davits that you, or cranes that you, booms that you see on the bow of the hood were for lowering and, and raising paravanes, among other things. And that way she could steam into a minefield and hopefully the mines would come up unless she ran directly into them. And then they would send their boats to, to shoot them up and get rid of them. So as I mentioned, there, was, there are cable hawsers uh, on cable reels. There are flake lines and there are coil lines. So you can do any combination of the above. Um, flags and pennants, getting back to the, those, there are examples of ensigns flags. These are British ones, but the Canadian ones are identical except for the Canadian coat of arms, which is in the fly portion of the flags. You can find these on um, national flag series on the web, and you can print them out at any size you like. Um, Canada used the white ensign, the blue ensign, and the red ensign from 1910 uh, right up until uh, 1965, I believe, when the maple leaf flag came into effect. The white ensign was the primary ensign. The blue and the red flags are, in fact, jacks which means that the jacks were always flown from the bow, this, the bow sprits here, and usually only on the bow. Unless you were a merchantman, you would fly a red ensign. If you were an auxiliary ship, you would fly a blue ensign from the stern. All commissioned warships had a combination, um, and a, a commissioned warship would fly a commissioning pennant, which is one of these long trailey things here. That would be flown from the main mast. The white ensign would always be flown from the gaff or the stern staff if, at, if in harbor. Uh, if you were alongside, you would flow them at the stern staff. And if you were at sea, you would fly it from a gaff. If you're going into battle, you would very often fly a battle ensign up at the top of the main mast or the foremast. Um, the, there's a whole range of distinguishing flags that can be used, and again, apologize for the poor photocopy, uh, they would be only flown from the top of the foremast when that person is on board. So you know that uh, the royal standard is probably a member of the royal family on board the ship, uh, or a vice admiral, or whoever. Uh, but those would always be flown on the on the foremast. Ensigns would always be lowered at night, uh, except when at sea. And uh, in in the in harbor, tied up alongside, you'd have a jack at the jack staff, and an ensign flown at the at the stern. Uh, merchant ships when passing and other ships when passing, they would salute one another by lowering your, your, your ensign to the dip and then back up again. And that was uh, sort of compulsory etiquette for flags. You'd find flags and, and you can get uh, sets of, uh, of flags for, available from uh, Hawk Graphics and uh, uh, there's a slight difference in World War II flags from other times, but uh, basically signal flags, as long as you know which, num which letters are which, you're, you'll be okay. Um, they can be uh, obtained. 
as I mentioned uh, once before, you can wrap, them, and, and in these one cases, uh, come with the Corvette kit, uh, there are cloth flags. Ships coming in and out of harbor would fly either of the two combinations. In this case, uh, Long Branch here is flying K uh, or, or international code sign and then K487, uh, which is our pennant number. So that if you're looking from shore and you can't see the side of the ship, you would see the flags flying and you'd know which ship it is. Uh, alternately, Fundy shows um, her, her call letters. Uh, this is being C. Uh, gee, I'd have to remember. Um, anyway, her call, her four letter radio call sign. So if you want to call her up on wireless radio, you'd be able to see the flags and know what her call sign is. Um, Flags have many different functions on board ship. They um, can be wrapped around. Uh, if you had awnings that spread out over the quarter deck, you'd often use flags around the perimeter to uh, shield your cocktail party guests from other ships or other uh, winds and things like that. Um, they, but they're primarily used as a communication device and almost invariably secured to the flag deck um, below. What are the meanings of some of the flags? Well, they all have international code meanings. And if you, if you get a seamanship manual or even look it up online, you can find um, all the different meanings of the flags. So they have international meanings, but additional to that, Naval codes had specific functions as well. So flag F or Foxtrot, um, this diamond one here, I think, is used uh, when you're flying on off air, oh, flying aircraft. Um, so Foxtrot flown at the right hand side of, the, of an aircraft carrier would mean that she's busy involved flying on and off aircraft. P, uh, means you require a pilot or a P and requires you have a pilot on board. Uh, so you almost always see those flags flying when a ship's coming in and out of harbor. Man overboard, um, obviously you've, you've, you'd run that flag up when you're doing, a, you're going to execute a turn to go pick up somebody that's fallen overboard or you're doing an exercise to pick up a, a dummy that some coxswain is thrown overboard to get people trained. Flag R Romeo means two things in harbor for the for a naval vessel. It means ready duty ship, means that you're ready to go on uh, very, very quick notice, like half an hour notice or less. And uh, if you're at sea, it would be uh, flown up or down on the uh, yard to indicate that you're going to be replenished. Uh, so you, when you're under replenishment, you'd you'd find that you found the you fly the flag, uh, Romeo. Also, um, there's often single or double balls flown from the mast. A, a ball signal uh, would indicate that you're at anchor. If it's a single ball, double ball would mean you're. Uh, you're under tow or not under control. And triple balls would be flown, or triple lights in the case of minesweepers, would be indicate that you're actually engaged in minesweeping. So at night you see the three green lights would be lit up on the sweepers to indicate that she's busy doing her assigned function. Um, a lot of the time you'll find uh, jetty dioramas or things like that without any uh, regard for the fact that the ship don't normally tie up directly rubbing against a jetty. They're almost invariably bumpers lowered down from the jetty and they're either secured to the jetty in the case of large bumpers or in the case of ships coming up through the locks for example 
they would lower their own bumpers, uh, smaller ones down, and secure them to stanchions. And that prevents the ship from rubbing up against the, uh, the side of the, uh, of the lock or the dock and destroying the paintwork. Um, that's getting pretty well covered off what everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to contact Bill or myself with some feedback, and we'll be glad to try and address them and, and uh, maybe uh, do some other uh, topics uh, in the future. So it goes without saying, you've expanded well beyond the instructions that come with the kits. The kits uh, there, typically come with a rudimentary, you know, string a couple of lines to fancy up the model. You yeah. need good resources. Good references, yeah. yeah. Good, good uh, anatomy of the ship. There's, there's a number of different books. Uh, you've got a lot of them here, um, and uh, they don't necessarily have to be of the vessel that you're modeling. You can, you can get your, your experience built up by, by looking at the different uh, topics available. You get books on knots, you get books on the, the exactly. flags, the signaling. Exactly. Knots and flags and ropes and lines and so on. How deep you want to dive into this. Uh, obviously you've done a lot of research and I understand you have a large library of your own to reference. Uh, fairly large. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the different questions come up and, and I, I really get enjoyment out of it. Uh, one of the things I, I found out this week, somebody asked a question on, the, on Facebook about what color were depth charges? And that's a basic question, but, you know, yes, you're right, the, the kit instructions don't tell you most of the time. In fact, all Canadian depth charges that were issued from naval stores were uh, a dark gray. Uh, many of them on board ship would get repainted to match the camouflage color if they had time and, and wanted to go to that trouble. You, you can see MTB pictures, for example, with the, the depth charges painted the color of the camouflage because they didn't use them very often. On ships like Corvettes, where they're hoping to use them or did use them more often, they, they often wouldn't get repainted. So we're going to leave a link below to Ian's earlier visit from last year so you can review that if necessary. This expands upon it and we have you scheduled to come in again, I think. Next yes, I, I hopefully next time I'll go more into depth on uh, colors and camouflages and uh, particularly for Canadian vessels uh, which I have as my preference and uh, we'll see if we can uh, get into that in more detail. Excellent so if you have anything you want to add you want to share and you have any questions leave a comment below and we'll be glad to answer them for you. As always thanks for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Thank you. you. Okay don't forget please subscribe slap that bell hit that like button and join Team Hobby Center.